Uh, hello, I'm uh, Wu Xiong, and we are just going to start the third session of today's agenda. And uh, for this, I am very pleased to introduce Dr. He Dong Lee, Director General at the Institute of Education and Innovation. Dr. Lee is a pioneer in researching and advancing quality university education and technology enhanced learning. She wears multiple hats as the director of e-learning and as a research professor of the Center for Teaching and Learning at Seoul National University. She's also a specially appointed associate professor at Hokkaido University in Japan. And of course, she's directed various research projects on reforming education here in South Korea with municipal governments here and has authored several books on the topic as well. Dr. Dr. Hedong Lee, the floor is all yours. Um, thank you. Uh, yeah, I'm He Zhang Li. I'm moderating this session. Um, the title of this session is um, Bridging the Gap Between Talent and Opportunity, New Flexible Models of Higher Education Designed to Meet the Demands of the Future. The economic recovery from COVID-19 will depend in part on the ability of workers to upskill and reskill through the acquisition of more flexible lifelong learning experiences like micro-credentials. Micro However, the lack of a universally accepted way to value these micro-credentials and their accompanying skills complicates such efforts. In this presentation, Western Governors University leadership will explore this challenge and its implications for learner earners and employers into the future. The conversation will focus on realistic solutions that educators can pursue now to ensure credentials have meaning and value for those seeking jobs, for those uh, looking to hire. The presentation is intended for higher education leaders, administrators, and faculty members who are interested in new, more flexible models of higher education, including competency-based education, stackable degrees, lifelong learning systems, and alternative non-degree credentials. After participating in this session, attendees will have a better understanding of the critical role that stackable degrees and high-value micro-credentials will play in the future of education, especially in a post-COVID-19 economy. Participants will gain insight into the key challenges surrounding micro-credentials and their accompanying skills, the lack of agreed upon definitions and formats, and how this deficiency complicates their broader acceptance across the education and work. Attendees will also learn what they can do to assist in the work of creating trust, recognition, and portability of credentials for the benefit of other learners everywhere. We have three presenters, three panelists in this session. First speaker is Sarah DeMarc, Vice President of Program Development at Western Governors University. She will provide an overview of WGU's competency-based model and achievement and credentialing framework. The conversation will provide insights for how WGU defines their credential ecosystem from badges to micro-credentials to degrees, including a discussion of the wins and challenges associated with this complex work. The second panelist is Casey Thorne, Director of Skills Architecture at Western Governors University. She will discuss the critical role of rich skills descriptors in valuing and building employer trust in micro-credentials. She will further explore WGU's important work to promote aligned approaches to skills-based education and hiring across a broad range of educational institutions and industry sectors through the Open Skills Network, a dynamic coalition of over a thousand universities and employers from across the United States. Third speaker is Darren Hobbs, Director of Academic Records and Credentials at Western Governors University. He will provide the audience with a preview of the WGU Achievement Wallet, a mobile first tool designed to surface competency and skills-based achievements to students, along with geolocated career insights related to each learner's dynamic achievement profile. 
After presentation, panelists will take questions from the audience to allow for a deeper dive into Western Governors University's competency-based model and supporting tool sets and open resources. Now, let's listen to Sarah's presentation first. Sarah, the floor is yours. Thank you, uh, and thank you for that introduction. Uh, good morning, good afternoon, good evening. Um, I'm going to go ahead and share my screen and put that into presentation mode. All right, let's let's dive right in. Um, some of the work that um, Casey and Darren and I are sharing, one is to give you a little bit more context um, about WGU, Western Governors University. And so our university was founded in 1997 by 19 US uh, governors. And what this university was really built to try to solve for was a workforce development issue. Um, in our Western states, we have a lot of rural areas and there was a workforce development need for individuals to serve in really needed roles, but they didn't have the means to enroll in a higher ed um, institution, whether that was location-based or whether that was for um, monetary reasons uh, or just having that flexibility. Um, most of our uh, students, as you can see on the right, are full-time workers. And so finding a, a university that offers uh, flexible online learning to take location um, out of the, the list of potential barriers was a, a key point in um, um, the design of this university. So right now we have over 130,000 full-time students. Uh, we don't have part-time students. Uh, we just have full-time students and they enroll um, in a degree program on, you know, on their first day. Um, we have over 200,000 graduates and we have graduates in all 50 states. We have four colleges, uh, one in uh, teacher education, health professions, business, and IT, and we have over 60 degrees um, across those four colleges. Um, I'm going to go into a little bit more detail about uh, competency-based, um, but all of our degree programs are online. There are a couple exceptions of um, in-person um, education or requirements for nursing and for teaching, but all of the, the courses are otherwise um, courses that students can complete um, on their own time, uh, at their own pace, and wherever they are. Um, another really interesting thing about Western Governors University is our tuition model. Uh, so we um, charge a flat rate uh, for a six month term. So students can take as many courses as they want um, in that six months. And there's only um, one fee, uh, regardless of how many courses that they want to take, uh, which fits really nicely into our competency based model, where students are encouraged to accelerate, you know, through the concepts and topics that they know, um, and spend more time on some of those areas that might be new to them. So the profile of a WGU student um, is unique in that uh, we are serving um, a really heavy number of underserved populations. You can see in the right hand corner, 69% um, uh, of our student population is in one or more underserved populations. So this could be a first generation college students. Uh, this could be students of color low income earners or rural students. And so this really, this competency-based model is really something that is meant to work with the individuals on their own time, at their own pace, and is really meant to have that flexibility um, to be able to, to support that. So WGU aims to be the most student-centric university. And we really do think that students are at the center of what we do. Um, one of the things that are, or a couple of the things, I guess, that are unique about uh, Western Governors Universities is that we only offer programs. Um, students do not come to WGU to enroll in a single course. Uh, they are coming to WGU to get a credential. 
Um, and one of the areas, and Casey's gonna talk a little bit more about this later, but really the work that we're doing to ensure that our programs are aligned to workforce needs. We're, we do a lot of work um, to, to make sure that our programs are aligned with the skills that employers are looking for. And all of our programs are purposely designed to ensure that our graduates are meeting those employer needs. We also have um, a personalized assessment pathway. And so again, students can kind of go at their own pace. I'll talk a little bit more about that in an upcoming slide, but that is a really uh, unique aspect uh, to competency-based education. Um, we are not a research institution. We are a teaching institution. Um, all of our um, faculty are completely focused on teaching students and student success. Um, and we have specialized faculty roles um, and students are receiving um, personalized uh, support. Um, let's see, I'm gonna jump to the next slide to talk a little bit about our specialized faculty. So unlike traditional universities where there is a faculty member that does curriculum and assessment and mentoring and all of the course instruction and creating the assessments and grading them, we have disaggregated our faculty model, which is great because we are really allowing individuals to do what they love and to do what they do best. And so we do have four types of faculty at Western Governors. Uh, we have curriculum and assessment developers, and these are subject matter experts in their field of instructional design or assessment expertise that um, look to select and develop course materials and assessments that meet the learning outcomes of the course and program. We have program mentors, which provide one-on-one -on -one support to students. They meet uh, weekly on an ongoing basis. Students receive their program mentor on the first day, and that program mentor stays with them through the course of their program. They develop really strong relationships. We have course instructors, which are subject matter experts um, in, their, uh, the, in the course that they are um, supporting. And we have evaluators who are also subject matter experts um, that are specifically hired to do the evaluation of our performance assessments. Um, all of these faculty have um, uh, terminal degrees, so masters or PhDs in their level or in their area of expertise. So students are really well supported with um, individuals that understand them, know them, but also really understand their domains. So there's a couple pieces that I think are core to competency-based education. One is around the quality of our programs. So we have councils that are made up of subject matter experts and industry experts for each of our programs. Uh, we also have academic and industry advisors to ensure that our programs are meeting the needs of the of employers and the industry. Um, we have assessments that are designed into the curriculum and everything we do is data driven. One of the things that we're doing, and Casey's gonna go into a little bit more detail, is really focusing on the alignment to workforce needs. I think the best compliment that we could get is a student coming out of a course or an assessment and say, I know exactly why I needed to learn that. That's something that I'm gonna to need to know to do my job. Um, so really trying to make sure we've got that strong alignment. We do regular um, surveys and reviews with employers, and we do regular surveys with our graduates to ensure that we are meeting those um, needs for their career success. Another interesting piece to competency-based education is assessment. In fact, assessment really is the heart of competency-based education. A couple of things that I think are interesting about this is that in a competency-based uh, course, Students can go at whatever pace um, is comfortable for them. So depending on their background, their experience, um, their time commitment, um, students can start and complete courses um, at any point. Um, all they need to do is pass the final assessment. Um, that is the only requirement for the course. 
Our courses have performance assessments, which typically require a demonstration of skills and abilities, um, which are then graded by our evaluators, or there are um, objective assessments, which are more typical multiple choice assessments. Our multiple choice assessments are proctored um, with live proctoring on, and they are taken online on demand so students can register and take an assessment at any point they're ready. And our performance assessments all go through uh, checks for integrity to make sure that it truly is their own work and that there's no plagiarism. So a lot of uh, security um, is put into ensuring that our assessments are valid and that we're maintaining the integrity of our programs. I mentioned the faculty and that we have specialized roles and that personalized one-on-one -on -one support. And the faculty is guided by real-time data. Because we are an online institution, we're able to really track students' progress and see where they might need help. And many times we know that students are going to need help even before they do. So really continuing to advance our data models to be able to uh, provide that proactive support to all of our students. So here is an example of what we are doing um, when we're talking about digital stackable credentials. So all of our programs are based in skills, which then sort of roll up into competencies. We think about competencies as a, a set of skills that are contextualized for a particular program. And really, when we're talking about credentials, that's just a packaging of competencies. And so we can decide if we want to offer a credential at the competency level, such as organizational response to, val to value-based care. This is a health professions example. Or we can offer a credential at the course level, such as regulatory and market origins of value-based care. We also have certificates, um, which could be value-based care, and also a full degree, which would be a master of health leadership. So we're looking at opportunities to package up our um, skills and competencies in meaningful components that actually have market value and, and um, skills that are important to employers. Um, ideally, uh, we would be looking in all of our programs to identify what those big milestones are of achievement and ones that have marketable value. So that way students can start to earn those achievements and have those credentials to be able to um, help their, um, you know, inner, their short term career success, you know, on their way to the degree. So we're really developing um, flexible learning, um, that competency-based pathways, and really being able to make our skills um, transparent. Um, Casey and Darren um, are going to have some great information to show that in a little bit more detail. In fact, Darren's got some really great um, visuals to show how we're, how we're doing that. But one of the values of this is that this is providing good on-ramps and off-ramps for students on their way to a credential. So we're ideally students would be able, if they need to stop or pause on their journey to a credential or to a degree, that they're able to have value and show the skills that they've been achieving along the way. So Casey, um, I will pass this to you uh, to talk about the work that we're doing with skills. Great, thank you, Sarah. So as Sarah mentioned, we're really exploring different opportunities at WGU to provide our students with more types of credentials that can help support them through a lifelong journey across both education and their career. What we know is that skills add value and skills are becoming the new currency of the digital age, both in the education sector as well as in the workforce. Employers are moving from a model of human capital management to human potential management. And we hear from employers more and more that the degree is no longer a great proxy for them to be able to evaluate that human potential, what someone can actually do. And that's where skills become very important into a credential journey and to provide uh, relevance and transparency into what the different credentials that we may issue to a student actually represent. 
if we have learned anything um, in the both education and workforce from COVID-19, it's that students, learner workers are going to need more opportunities to skill and reskill both in their current industries or in order to move industries and to shift into a complete different career changes. So this is why it's so important for us to be thinking differently about the types of credentials as a higher ed education institution that we can offer to our students that don't just have to be the degree. So the way that we've started approaching this at WGU, we can go ahead and advance to the next slide, is through really evaluating what skills underlie our current programming. And the place that we started to do that was we looked at all of our existing programs and our competencies and evaluated those against what the labor market is asking for in terms of high demand skills. But the best proxy that you can get from labor market research in that direction right now are keywords that are great signals about what the labor market is asking for, but context is everything in lacking in that information. For example, as we were conducting our initial analysis of all of our degree programs, we saw that communication is a key skill demanded in nearly every industry sector. Yet what communication looks like as applied across different job roles in different industries like software engineering, nursing, teaching professions looks very different. What those individual jobs uh, do in terms of communication with the people they're communicating with, technology and tools that they are using to communicate are very different. And so from our work in trying to ensure that all of our credentials were aligned to those high value skills, we recognize we need to have really tight collaboration with employers to understand truly what it is that they need in, in their job roles when they say they're looking for good communication skills. So as we started to have those conversations, collaborations with strategic employer partners at WGU, we started collecting a lot of information and data about skills that added that rich context that will really help us target and help our learners both grow and demonstrate the skills that are important to employers. And from that evolved what we refer to as a rich skills descriptor. What the rich skills descriptor is, is a machine readable syntax that contains important contextual information about a skill. It includes keywords that the labor market may be using to talk about that skill. It includes an outcome statement that describes what that skill looks like as applied for particular job roles. It also includes linkage to real time dynamic labor market insights. So from that, you have a very powerful little data package that we have termed the RSD or the rich skills descriptor that we use to embed into all of our digital achievements that we are issuing to our students. So through that, as we surface these digital achievements to our students, they're able to see the discrete skills job roles, what that skill looks like has applied for those job roles, and real-time information about how in demand that skill is in those sectors, and perhaps even for those job roles within their particular region or area that they are located. All of our competencies that we have at WGU, we have aligned to rich skills descriptors and are uh, now sitting at over 3,000 WGU competencies that have been tagged with those rich skills descriptors that we have built through collaboration with employer partners. Through the development of those rich skills descriptors, we have collected now a library of over 13,000 rich skills descriptors that we use to help inform all of our curriculum and assessment development efforts so that we can ensure we are providing our students with the most relevant market aligned programs and credentials possible. We're not alone in this work. As WGU started to talk about the importance of skills more nationally and broadly, it really started a movement. 
And this movement has resulted in a coalition development known as the Open Skills Network, which is a uh, large collection of higher ed institutions, government, military, and employers, both nationally and internationally, that have come together to recognize the importance of skills and to work together on creating open libraries of rich skills descriptors and open tools and technologies that can accelerate skills-based hiring and education systems so that we can start offering more learner workers the opportunity to be recognized for the skills that they have and not just the degrees that they hold. Currently, the Open Skills Network is sitting at over 450 organizations that are part of this movement with over a thousand individual members of the network. We have uh, done a lot of work in rallying together over the power of rich skills descriptors and skills data embedded into digital credentials. And as we see more of these rich skills descriptors libraries come online, we can really tap into the power of those to surface important skills information to our students and employers alike. And at this point, I'll go ahead and hand it over to my colleague, Darren, to talk a little bit about how we are bringing skills information to the real world for our students. Thank you so much, Casey. Um, I think that I hope that it's clear from what Casey was presenting how important we believe the information that uh, skills can provide to learners so that they can understand the value of the credentials that they're earning and communicate about those credentials. Um, I'm the former registrar here at Western Governors and the, the academic transcript that we have been using in higher ed for a very long time that provides a vehicle for communicating around what courses a learner has completed and what grade they earned and how all of that adds up toward a degree was developed simply and exclusively so that one institute of higher education could speak to another and the learner could take that record and present it when transferring to a different institution or seeking to get admitted into another degree program. That was the sole purpose of the academic transcript. Learners come out of their experience with their degree, but we've discovered through focus groups and conversations that learners don't always know how to describe what they know, what they learned. Uh, they can they can make an attempt at it, but it's oftentimes difficult to put it into words. Um, struggling with representing on a resume, how they qualify for a job. The beauty of the work that the skills architecture team has done, they've made that easy now. They've captured that information beyond and deeper and in a richer way than an academic transcript ever could or did. Um, so. When we thought about the future of a record for learners, the wallet is what we have been focusing on, where we can represent the credentials that learners earn through open data standards, like the open badges data standard, which is represented in these icons that you see on the slide. And through the use of these badges, we can surface information to the student about what that credential means. What skills did you master? What language can you use when you're talking about your learning and communicating that to an employer? We also are driven by the notion that these credentials belong to the learner. They, they need to own these and they need to be empowered to, to use these credentials in the way that best suits their needs in the time frame that they need to share them however they want to share them. So the concept of a learner-owned record is, is manifest through this notion of a wallet and also a learning and employment record that we also are very much invested in. So you can see from the image here that the Achievement Wallet at Western Governors presents to the learner the credentials that they have earned 
um, and allows them to, to control how they use those credentials. Let's go to the next slide. They can tap into any of these credentials. And as you can see here, all of this rich information about that credential can now be presented to them so that they can understand the power of their learning, the value of their learning. And most importantly, they can share these credentials out as they desire through the wallet. Here, we're seeing an example of a learner that's accessed a single credential, the competency credential. But the learner can actually take the credentials that exist within their wallet and they can curate them, combine them into different unique records packages to share out so that they don't necessarily need to deliver every credential they've earned. They can deliver the ones that are most germane and relevant to a job role that an employer is interested in. And being able to curate from their records and not just credentials they've earned at Western Governors, but credentials they've earned elsewhere and portfolio evidence that can support other types of learning that maybe isn't credentialed through higher ed, um, but they can, they have life experience and they want to provide some portfolio evidence to support the assertion of the skills that they possess through those experiences. The wallet can do all of that. It can also contain proofs of identity, such as a state issued ID, uh, or possibly even proof of COVID vaccination. Um, all of this can flow into the wallet through the use of open data standards, such as the W3C verifiable credential uh, wrapper that can be put around these credentials to maintain their validity, their authenticity, the trustability. Again, a learner can curate from their records. All of their credentials create unique record packages in order to assert their unique skills and talent brand that is targeted to a specific employer or sector. But how do they know about that? Let's go to the next slide. The wallet is actually a combination of different applications that is presented through a unified experience to the learner called the wallet. So not only do they see their credentials, but they will actually be able to understand and see how their credentials relate in real time as they stack, as they earn them to job opportunities that are local to them across the nation or across the world. They'll be able to understand how their credentials, their skills speak to the needs of these jobs, these job roles in order to empower them to understand what they qualify for. And if they have gaps, that can be shown to them as well. And how they can go and satisfy or shore up those gaps in order to improve their skills signature. I think this is probably at least as powerful as surfacing credentials to learners that are rich with data and descriptions around their learning. But the idea that we can now take this, the, this, the skills denominated credentials, skills described and articulated job roles, and do some comparisons, do some business logic and automation around how these things relate and intersect and match, that now gives us the power to surface to learners new visibility, open up the vistas of horizons that they hadn't even conceived of in terms of pathways to opportunity, to new jobs, how their skills may relate to what the direction they were heading, but also relate to this other direction they had not thought of that may be more interesting to them. We can show this information to them, salary potentials, we can surface that to learners, all because of skills denominated credentials, that may now be surfaced via a wallet in a user experience 
that empowers the learner to take charge of their skills and talent brand and make assertions around the same. All right. Um, hopefully that gives a, a good overview of the, of the work that uh, we've been doing at Western Governors University. Um, I will, I guess, open it up for, for questions. Okay, thank you very much for all of your presentation. Um, Western Governors University's innovative initiatives and experiences are very impressive. Now it's time to take questions. Um, uh, I'd like to ask a question to Casey first, because uh, you mentioned a lot about the skill, uh, skill based, the skills denominated or something. But when you refer to a skill, what specifically do you mean? Because sometimes I'm confused of the meaning of skill, competency, capability, and so on. Does that definition vary between employers and educational institutions? How do you define it? That is a great question. And I would say um, you are not alone in those sentiments. One of the things that uh, I was surprised by as we started exploring this world of skills at WGU was that there was not a common understanding or definition around what a skill is. There still is a lot of, I think, depending on the organization that you talk to, um, difference in how they define skills, competencies, capabilities, behaviors. So when we think about labor market insights that we can gather from labor market research, from AI that will crawl the web and look at different job postings to identify what, what employers are looking for, um, they get back what they would refer to as skills, which are broad keywords and terms that represent what a skill is, but again, the context is really lacking. And so when we say skill at WGU, when we say skill at the Open Skills Network, and really what we are trying to rally everyone around is, it is a rich skills descriptor. And in order to be actionable, a skill needs to represent what that performance looks like as applied on the job and describe it for learners. And we need to come together in terms of using a common language like the rich skills descriptor in how we talk about skills across education and hiring sectors in order to help each other out and make sure that we're providing our learners with what they need. So when we say skill, we are referring to the rich skills descriptor, which is all of the metadata associated, the keywords, a contextualized skill statement that describes what that skill looks like as applied. So that is what we mean when we say skill. Thank you for your answer. And um, maybe uh, this question should be going to Sarah. Um, in the competence-based model, what does assessment look like? How does the, uh, the Governor's University ensure a student has truly mastered course material? And also, uh, since COVID-19, um, a lot of uh, traditional universities have kind of troubles in assessment. Well, projects, reports, papers are kind of less problematic, but sometimes, sometimes some tests need to be uh, need to be proctored strictly because a lot of people are worried of cheating. How do you ensure like cheating free assessment? You are mute. Thank you, sorry. Uh, one of the things that um, is unique about WGU is that we have the opportunity to really think through what program design looks like. So before we even begin to develop the assessments themselves, we think about what is important for students to be able to do and show um, as you know for getting a particular job? What do employers expect? Um, so we don't want them to um, you know, talk about how they would teach lessons. We want them to actually create lesson plans or have videos that show that they are um, teaching lessons or how they do classroom management. So 
um, one of the things that we really do at the out front of design is think through like, what would we want to see as evidence um, that students really have uh, mastered those competencies and skills. And so once we start to define what evidence we would be looking for, we start to then design that into the actual um, courses themselves. And so sometimes our courses are those more traditional multiple choice um, assessments. Sometimes they are uh, more performance assessments, um, like a lesson plan or a video of, of their um, instruction. Um, and sometimes it's both, uh, depending on um, what the competencies are. Different competencies lend themselves to different assessments. So we have a lot of flexibility at WGU to choose the best assessments um, to get that evidence of mastery. And so one of the things that um, we've been doing, and, and it was actually interesting, we did not change our practices um, for COVID. Um, we have always had our assessments um, online proctored. Um, for all of the um, objective assessments, like the multiple choice exams. Um, all of our exams also have uh, multiple forms on them. So uh, we do have, and we have a, a team of psychometricians and assessment security experts that are constantly watching the data, constantly watching uh, websites uh, to make sure we, our items are not exposed in a way that um, they should not be. Um, so we do a lot of monitoring and maintenance of all of our assessments to keep them up to date. Um, for the performance assessments, um, students, um, there we have a um, authenticity um, check to make sure that it's the student's own work um, and all of that goes through our processes. So we've had those uh, measures in place uh, since the beginning. And so we were um, very fortunate um, that we did not have to um, pivot uh, when um, everything went online. So uh, you mentioned about the online proctor. Uh, mm -hmm. During the test, does online proctor kind of uh, uh, monitor of uh, whether the student is Googling the answer outside of the test or something. Yeah. Is there a kind of function? Um, at the beginning of each assessment, um, the student has to take their camera, um, show everything that's in their room. Um, audio is enabled so proctors can listen to see if, they're, if they hear anything that they shouldn't be hearing. Um, the camera is on. Um, so that way they can continue to, to monitor what's happening. And yes, there are um, live proctors actually monitoring students while they take the test and look for different abnormalities um, in test taking. And so at any point, if a student or if a proctor thinks that something doesn't sound right or look right, they can pause that assessment and ask the student to show the room again or, or you know, or anything else that uh, they might need to verify that the student is, is you know, taking the test as, as intended. So we can check whether the student is uh, uh, popping another window or a messenger to communicate yeah. with others. Yes. Yeah. So. Uh, the, the window is locked down, so students okay not pull up you know, websites or any notes or things like that during the assessment. So oh, it's okay. a very secure um, a testing site. Okay. Or testing, then, then, um, yeah, OK. Thank you. Uh, yeah. Also, I'd like to ask you a, a question to Darren. Uh, you mentioned about uh, the value of the achievements, achievement wallet. How will other institutions view the value of the achievements and the achievement wallet? Thank you for that question. So we actually are seeing here that uh, there is a movement uh, among institutions of higher education and high schools of representing credentials through uh, digital open standards to, to not only empower learners to own those credentials, but more, well, equally importantly, these open data standards and all of the metadata that's behind these credentials, not just the human experience, but the metadata that is machine readable and actionable um, is being built so that it can plug into student information systems, human resource information systems, 
uh, job recruitment systems so that this data can flow in and, and automatically check off the boxes that, that can be done through the machine. Um, the, uh, the interface of the wallet is the human side of it. And we've already done some pilots where we've shown the power and value of exchanging credentials from one institution to the next, not through a transcript submission, but through digital credential presentation from the learner and how those credentials fit our articulation agreements that we may have that's at a course to course level, how those credentials can also qualify for transferability despite articulation agreements because of the match of the skills and, and, and data behind the credential. So we have done that demonstration through some pilots that we did last year. And uh, in, in our Achievement Wallet uh, uh, exemplar project that we're doing now in the state of Indiana, we will repeat that exercise where credentials coming from uh, the Goodwill Excel Center High School system can flow into uh, the community college system of Ivy Tech or uh, of Indiana called Ivy Tech, as well as how credentials from Goodwill and Ivy Tech can flow into WGU. And so we, we are seeking to demonstrate that, that we, can, we can improve, streamline credit exchange through these credentials, through the wallet and the technology that supports the wallet. Um, and because we know that other schools in other areas are doing the same thing, um, this adoption is going to happen. And, and I think that we're gonna see the adoption picking up in speed over the next few years. Thank you very much. Uh, next, we have a question from YouTube live stream audience. Uh, as a global and online institution, how do you support international students? Who can take this question? Uh, I can take this one. Um, currently, we are just a US-based um, higher ed institution. Uh, we do have some global support, but they are for um, U.S. Um, individuals that might be in the military and stationed overseas. So we do have you know, the capability to do that, but right now we're focused on um, the United States workforce. Okay. Um, uh, the, the next question, uh, maybe any of you can answer this question. I've seen in many higher education institutions that there are discrepancies between the educational goals and final outcomes. Um, perhaps because those goals are not properly assessed in the end or something. So in addition to setting a beautiful goal, I think teaching and learning quality assurance system is critical to ensure the quality of the education in that institution. What is your quality assurance system at Western Governors University? Um, I can start and um, Casey or Darren, you know, feel free to, to jump in on this. Um, Really, our big um, goal is to protect the integrity of our assessments um, and to ensure that our programs align with um, the market. Uh, we want students to graduate uh, with uh, degrees and credentials that actually will enable them to, to get jobs and continue to pursue their career. But it's really the integrity of the assessment and the quality of the assessment that we hold most dear. Um, one of the interesting things about uh, Western Governors is uh, we do provide very robust curriculum, a lot of faculty support, but students do not have to engage in any of that. Um, if they are already confident and have that experience in a particular domain, they can go right to the assessment and demonstrate that they have those skills and competencies and move on to the next course. Um, so one of the things that we're doing, though, is we have continuous improvement of all of our courses, of all of our assessments, and all of our uh, programs themselves. So we are constantly checking to make sure our programs do have market relevance. Uh, we have uh, systems in place to 
um, allow students and faculty members to raise concerns about any of the courses or assessments um, they experience. But one of the great things about uh, WGU, because of the number of students and because of the online nature, we have a lot of data. So we can see in the data where students are struggling. We can see in the data what students are engaging with in terms of learning resources and what they're not, or what they're only clicking on and then not finding valuable and they don't go back to. So we are constantly looking um, you know, at our curriculum, at our assessments and at our programs to ensure that they are meeting our quality standards and that we are continuously improving those uh, throughout the life of those programs. Um, but it's really, um, I think, the assessment piece um, that we hold most dear because that really is the core um, to competency-based education and really is the, the key to integrity. Thank you, uh, thank you very much. Uh, well, time is almost up, but I, I'd like to ask a really quick question about this uh, because I'm really curious about this. I believe you must have course evaluation system for an individual course. How does a course evaluation result affect each faculty members? Uh, we also have course evaluation system in Korean universities and most of the conventional universities, but the results are not that critical for their job security. How much is it critical uh, to faculty members at Western Uni Governance University? Well, one of the things, again, that's unique is that um, Western Governors does not give um, grades. Um, so we um, look to see whether a student has demonstrated competency, competency or has not quite yet demonstrated competency. And in that case, they are able to um, attempt that assessment again. Um, so because we are um, a criterion referenced um, assessment organization, really we're just looking at that demonstration of, of mastery and then they can move on. So we don't give A's or B's or, or any grades like that. It's just they've demonstrated that competency or, or not quite yet. But um, um, students are given the opportunity to retry um, because really that's what we're looking for is that evidence. And so students do have opportunities to try the assessment again. All right, thank you. Thank you. Uh, uh, thank you for your answer. Uh, I wish we could have more time to discuss more questions, uh, but maybe we should expect the next chance. Thank you all for your wonderful presentation and discussion. It was a great and a meaningful session to be able to learn Western Governors University's experience and insight. Thank you all for joining this session. Thank you. Bye. Thank you for having us.